Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you guys for joining tonight. We're going to introduce the Northern California. This is all new for 2023, the Northern California Six Pack of Peaks Challenge. Somebody's going to go, wait a minute. I thought you've had a NorCal challenge for several years already. And that's kind of true and kind of not true. So I need to give a little, I need to back up just a little bit. Um, we, uh, when I was living in, in uh, Berkeley, in the Bay Area, I scouted all the peaks for the, what is now called the Bay Area Challenge. I had called it the NorCal Challenge, and there's, a, there's plenty of people in that area who say, yeah, that's considered NorCal, sort of, kind of. But then we also had a lot of feedback, like, hey, it'd be really nice to have some, like, real NorCal peaks up there uh, in, a, in a challenge. And so, this is all new. It's based in the higher peaks. We'll talk a little bit more about that, though. Um, I'm Jeff Hester. I'm the founder of the Six Pack of Peaks Challenge. And with me tonight, I have our trail curator and guidebook author, uh, you know, prolific guidebook author. And a lot of them are just basically on the hikes that we're talking about in this challenge. So John Soros, he's going to be joining us and telling us a little bit about the ins and outs and the need to know and the good to know kind of stuff for all of the, the peaks in the challenge. He lives up near Mount Shasta, and um, he also likes to uh, do dispersed camping on public lands. So it's a great way to be able to, you know, spend the night under the stars for free and not have to pay for your campsite. And he's got all of these books on here. We'll talk about how you can connect with him and you know, find out more about all his books and all of that good stuff. I'm gonna take a few minutes, probably five or 10 minutes and just kind of lay the, set the stage for how, what is the six pack of Peaks Challenge? How did it all get started? What's it all about? And this is a, a photo, actually, this is a photo of Mount Shasta and from the Bunny Flat Trailhead, which is, Again, the, the section that starts here and goes up to Helen Lake is part of the challenge. Uh, that's a photo I took when I uh, summited Shasta in 2018, and that was our, our first day on the, on the trail. Uh, the Six Pack of Peaks was created a long time ago, and it was really a part of my and my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, our training program for the 211 mile John Muir Trail. We were going to be hiking that in the summer of 2010. We needed to you know, make sure that our bodies and our, our mind was ready for the rigors of doing double digit mileage with a lot of vertical gain day in and day out. And so I created a training program that included successively taller peaks, um, th these happen to be in Southern California. So the two uh, photos on the right in this slide, uh, one of them is from San Gorgonio. And I, I think the other ones from might be from, I can't remember. I think that's Cucamonga, uh, just the trailhead. And, uh, but the one on the left was the proof that this training paid off because we completed the John Muir trail going from Yosemite to the top of Mount Whitney and felt great, you know, hiked all the way down, got in the car, drove all the way back to, uh, at the time we were living in San Clemente and uh, it was just a, a life-changing experience. Um, five years later, we actually partnered with Big City Mountaineers. I'll talk a moment about them and launched an official our first official six pack of peaks challenge in Southern California. This is a group, but we had about 84 finishers that first year in 2015. And this is some of them at our a little pizza party thing that we did. Well, how's it going today? Um, now we have 17 challenges all around the country. So it's grown way beyond my wildest dreams. Um, for a long time, I was the one who was doing, you know, basically scouting all the peaks and, you know, doing the legwork to figure out which ones should fit sort of the mold of the six pack of peaks. And uh, um, it's gotten to the point where I can't do that anymore. I can't do all of these. So there, therefore, we've brought in folks like John Soares uh, to help us as trail curators for a region. 
We have over 16,000 challengers and together they've, they've summited over 40,000 peaks uh, since 2015. And amazing stories, amazing adventures, friendships, relationships. Um, I, you know, it's just, it's, it's been amazing to me. Um, this is a sampling of just a few of the stories that you see maybe on Instagram with the hashtag six pack of peaks. And we have people from all different experience levels and all different age groups that are tackling the challenge for every, you know, we have young people like Koa in the wild, uh, in Southern California or the super hiking twins. A lot of people have heard of, we have people like the bats in central Oregon, the badass trail sisters who have done it. Um, this is their second year doing it. Now they did it last year and two of them are in their seventies. So it really can work for a, a wide range of, you know, ages, experience levels, and can be pretty accessible if you're willing to put in the work to um, get fit and uh, prepare yourself. The thing that I think this I'm really stoked about, though, is our partnership with our outdoor related nonprofits. And this is a photo of our primary one of our primary uh, uh, nonprofit partnership with Big City Mountaineers. Big City Mountaineers is based in Boulder, but they they work with under-resourced youth and give them what for most of them is their first wilderness experience, a week backpacking in the mountains or canoeing in the boundary waters. Um, many of them have never slept outside. You know, they're worried, you know, is a bear gonna eat me or do I have, what are all those things I have to think about? I never had to think about before. Um, and they've, they've looked at those mountains maybe, and they've thought, you know, I can't, I can't climb that. And they have this experience and they realize it, it transforms their perception of what's possible for them and opens up their eyes and their minds and opens up doors for their lives to think, you know, if I can climb that mountain or if I can hike that trail, what else can I do that I thought I couldn't? And so it's a really, we're really proud of that particular partnership. We also partnered with um, Leave No Trace. Uh, we're a community partner with them. And we have also done a lot of fundraising with the Heroes Project, which works with uh, veterans who've lost a limb and other people who've lost limbs to help rehabilitate and rewire their brains to uh, reconsider what's possible for them as well. So that's been stoked. I've been really stoked about that. As of the this figure here, one hundred twenty-eight thousand dollars raised for outdoor-related nonprofits as of the end of January. It's actually over one hundred twenty-nine thousand now, and continues to grow. So we're really happy about that. And that's really all due to all of the challengers who who help um, re who register and help make that possible. Uh, the NorCal Challenge. You know, there's great mountains in Northern California peaks and views all over the place. Great. And this is the selection. This is a high level view of sort of what we're looking at. Um, there's actually seven peaks that we'll talk about here. Um, you get to mix and match. So you can choose which of those seven will make up the six that you will do to complete your challenge. Of course, there's always usually a few people who are like, I'm going to do all of them. Um, I saw Philip was on the uh, in the in attendance tonight, and Philip is uh, he's done the San Diego challenge, he's done the Southern California challenge, he's done the Las Vegas challenge, he's done the Arizona challenge, and he's doing the Central Coast challenge, and he'll probably do this at some point. If I if I I wouldn't be surprised, and uh, he's the sort of guy who will he'll go out and do all of them if he can. Um, this sort of shaded circle here shows roughly, you know, an hour, hour, 15, hour and a half minute driving time from Redding. So you can see almost all of those peaks are very pretty accessible from that area. So we're going to switch gears here. We're going to take a quick look at the website, socialhiker.net, which is, uh, and the overview that we have for the Northern California challenge. I'll talk a little bit about that page and what you can find on it. And then we're gonna go uh, peak by peak and, and I'll let John kind of lead us through that. 
Um, one little piece of housekeeping, I mentioned this before we really kind of kicked off with the slides, is that if you have questions, there is the ability for you to ask a question. You'll have to use the, the Q&A uh, function on the bar. So where you see Q&A, you can, you can poke on that, say open a question uh, or ask a question, type it in, and we'll do our best to get you an answer. If we don't get to the, all the questions by the end of this webinar, which we are recording, we will um, make a point to get it to you in, in the notes and the writing afterwards. All right, let's, uh, I'm gonna stop that. Um, and I am going to share my browser. Are we good? John, can you see that? Yes, I can see it, looks good. All right, so this is the overview page for the, um, the Northern California Challenge. So I go to Social Hiker, I can go to Challenges, I can click on Northern California, and I can see a little bit about what it's about. Um, if I'm ready to go sign up, I can click the Get Started button. Um, we have a, an overview map of the challenge. This is interactive, so I can you know, zoom in and see more. I can go in and change the, the map layer if I wanted to go to uh, OpenStreetMap or something else, I could do that. And I can even go full screen if I if I so choose. And I think that probably messes up my screen sharing. But um, we have an overview of each of the peaks, just a really high level overview of the peak with a link to a detailed trail guide. And they come from different resources. Sometimes it's from, uh, some of these are from one of John's websites. Some of them are from another place, uh, uh, a, a trail association. Some of them are from all trails. And so we'll talk a little bit about those. One thing to be aware is this is sort of like the suggested routes. Um, you can choose the route you want to choose to take to um, get to a particular point. Some cases there might be something that's maybe a more a longer or more challenging hike, and maybe you're really chomping at the bit for that. You can do that. Uh, some of these you may be able to do as an overnight. So you could you know camp somewhere along the way, or maybe hit that summit and then camp on the way back down or you know, break it up into one or two days or three days, that's up to you. Um, and as we mentioned, there are seven peaks. So we have an extra one in there. Here's, here's John, a little bit more about him. And this is also where you can click on uh, his name here and it'll actually take you to his website and you can uh, learn all about the books that he's got available through Mountaineers Press, uh, his dispersed camping guide on Amazon and all and more of that. So, uh, and then finally, this section at the bottom will show the latest challenge hike logs. The note here is that because this is a new challenge and because we've had a really heavy snowfall this winter, um, nobody's logged a hike yet. We have a number of challengers registered for Northern California. Nobody's logged a hike yet, and I suspect we won't see that probably for our, for another month or two, at least. Uh, when we do, um, right now we're showing a sampling from across all of our challenges, but when we do um, uh, start getting Northern California challenges, this will change. It'll show only Northern California hike logs, and these are other challengers who have registered for the challenge, you can click on on uh, on this this hike log and actually see more photos and a little trip report basically for for that particular person and from that particular hike. And so that's just a little bit about the overview page. Um, hey, John, you want to take a look? Shall we dive in? Let's do it. All right. Well, let's take a look at Helen Lake. Um, this is this is um, this is an example of a, a a a hike that's in the challenge that isn't actually a peak. It is a point on the way up a larger, more technical peak, which is Mount Shasta. And the route that we're suggesting is Bunny Lake to, uh, or excuse me, Bunny Flats to Helen Lake. And um, this is the the route on all trails. And so we can take a kind of kind of look at that. John, you would anything you want to say about this particular one? There are actually several things that I want to say about this hike. 
obviously Mount Shasta is the iconic mountain in upper Northern California, 14,179 feet high. You can see it from all over Northern California and Southern Oregon. The hike that we are featuring here, as Jeff said, does not go all the way to the summit. So let me first put in a caveat here that climbing to the summit of Mount Shasta requires that you are in really good physical condition, that you have the right equipment, and that you have thoroughly checked out the conditions and you have experience in those types of hikes. Every year, somebody gets injured or killed climbing Mount Shasta to the summit of Mount Shasta. So don't get to Helen Lake and think, oh, it doesn't look that far up to the top. Let's just crank on up there. Don't do that. Another thing is you are going to need a permit to actually go all the way to Helen Lake because it's above 10,000 feet. You can get that right at the trailhead at Bunny Flat, it's self-issue. So you can do that there. You can also get it at the Mount Shasta Ranger Station in the town of Mount Shasta. Speaking of the Mount Shasta Ranger Station, it's a good idea to call them before you do this hike so you can get a handle on what the snow conditions are. And if there's any other information you should know, like are there any specific hazards at that specific time that you want to climb. As Jeff alluded to, all of Northern California really has gotten blanketed by uh, way above average snow. We really need it. We're really, really grateful. But that makes it a little more difficult to predict the best time to do all of these hikes because we just don't know when the snow is going to melt off. A lot of that is going to depend on how much snow we get between now and say early May at those higher elevations. So you'll, you will need to adjust that and uh, make sure that you can always call the governing agency of whatever, whatever agency is in charge of that and they can usually give you a pretty good idea of what the snow level is like there. Yeah, let me just uh, I have a question I, I'd okay. like to ask. I, so I know that this route, if you, for um, just to kind of add a little ominous overtone to this whole thing, you can kind of see on this 3D view, this looks like a trench almost, or a, a, a gully, if you will. Yes. And uh, that's what the route is known as, is Avalanche Gully. And uh Avalanche Gulch, yes. Avalanche exactly. Gulch. So, is the um, you know, is the would it be wise to look look at avalanche forecasting or anything like that for this? Well, that's why you should call Mount Shasta Ranger Station. There's also the there's a website. There's a fantastic group called um, the it's the Mount Shasta Avalanche Center. And if you just Google Shasta Avalanche, they will show up. They always have lots of good updated information on conditions in the mountain. So uh, I'm trying to see if there's a way that I can pop this in to, uh, to somewhere here. I'll just put this into to chat right now. Um, boom. There we go. So that will help you to, to see you know, to see what's going on there. And you'll see people actually do climb it in winter, but if you climb it in winter, you really got to know what you're doing. I mean, that's really not for uh, anybody who is at any level of amateur status when it comes to mountaineering skills. So I am definitely not at all encouraging you to do it in winter. Right. Um, one other thing I'll, I'll just mention, Having been there, Helen Lake isn't really a lake so much. No, it's, it's not. It's just a <laughs> flat place. It's where people camp when they're doing an overnight trip. People will, they will often hike to Helen Lake, spend the night on this flat area, and then get up at two in the morning and then make their summit push, which lets you know that this is not something that can really be done in a day. I know people who have done it in a day, but they are 
serious hardcore hikers. The one person I know that has done it is, is Lori Bagley, and she's also climbed Mount Everest. So that, that should give you some idea that uh, it's not for uh, it's not for everybody to do that. It's 7,000 feet, basically, from Bunny Flat to the summit. And there, there are guide services that do guided trips up Shasta. So if somebody is interested in taking it up to sort of that next level, that would be outside of the scope of this challenge. But yes. that would, might be a good way to uh, um, learn more and, and do it in a way where you're working with people who... Um, understand the risks and and the safety equipment and can help get you outfitted and trained and and lead your way up there know when it's time to turn around that's probably the most critical thing is like you, you whenever you do a mountain like this it's an attempt it's not i'm going to go summit this it's i'm going to try to summit it and if if the mountain lets me i'll, I'll do it and if everything can, works together the weather and and my body and my training and my equipment and everything and my team uh, it may happen. But uh, if any of those things falls apart, then you need to know like, oh, was, we're going to turn around here. And that's we're not going to make the summit this time. So yeah, all of that is fantastic advice. And I would strongly advise somebody who actually wants to summit the mountain to go with the guide service. And there's two or three good ones in the Mount Shasta area, you can Google that and, and find them. Almost all of the ways that you would summit Mount Shasta, go right by Helen Lake. Although there are other routes to go to, and if you can get to the top of the Shasta, Mount Shasta by going the, the Northern route or along the Eastern side, then uh, I would say you've done really well regarding the challenge. I don't know if Jeff would still let you put the pen in it, but uh, <laughs> you know, I would say you'd gone above and beyond. Yeah. All right, let's talk about Black Butte. This is this is one that you see right off Interstate Five um, as you kind of like pass through or near. Uh, is it uh, Mount Shasta City or Mount Shasta City? So it's just a couple miles north of Mount Shasta City, and when Mount Shasta itself is blocked in by clouds, people who don't know the area very well or it's their first time, they see Black Butte and they think it's Mount Shasta although it is not, it very much is not. It is a really cool, iconic mountain, much smaller, of course, in our area. I live on the north side, just to the north of Mount Shasta. So I've driven by Black Butte hundreds of times and I've climbed it at least a dozen times. It's a definitely an easier hike than climbing up to Helen Lake. You can also do it earlier in the year getting up to Helen Lake without there being snow there or only a little bit of snow, that's kind of more of probably a mid to late summer into early fall proposition. Whereas Black Butte, you can oftentimes do it in late May or even early May, just depending on the snow, but mm -hmm. certainly by mid June, you can get up there and do Black Butte. Well, you just as a point of contrast, you know, the high point of Black Butte is 6,358 feet yep. versus, you know, 14, over 14,000 feet for, for Shasta. So yeah, exactly, exactly. But this is a pretty significant climb. There's a, you know, roughly 2,000 feet of elevation gain or so. And just something to be aware of the last third or so of the hike goes through an area of talus. <laughs> big chunks of talus you will be able to see the route but just be aware you will be rock hopping and just going from rock to rock a few of them will be will move underneath your feet or could move underneath your feet and especially if you hike with dogs which i did for many many years and i had golden retrievers be aware that that rocky area can be challenging for your dog if you've got a uh, an agile dog that is in good shape, it can you know, it can make it, but just be aware of that 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 may not be an easy thing for your dog if you want to take your dog on it. Yeah, if yeah. Keep going down see. there, Jeff. I think I've got a picture uh, of the talus coming up there. Um, oh yeah, there's so some. That's the area. I don't actually have the trail, but that's the area where the talus is. Yeah. Yeah. 
some great views on there though. I know oh, when yeah. I've driven past it, I've looked at it and I thought, you know, I've wondered about the trail up there and I thought, you know, it looks really tough, you know, just from not knowing that there is actually a trail, you know, look, looking at it from the freeway side, it, it looks really, really tough. It's very steep. So you look at the, ooh, I would not want to climb straight up that, but the trail overall is graded pretty well. Then it gets into that talus area and it kind of runs kind of level for a bit there. And then you got some kind of steep climbing. Just one other thing when you are right at the summit, be careful up there because it's to actually get to the actual summit. Summit is a you know, little tricky. You got to kind of, uh, I mean, you're at the summit when you're there, but there's the old platform where the lookout tower used to be. It's just a you know, steep drop offs up there, just make sure you're paying close attention to what you were doing and what your companions are doing and, and things like that. Right. Especially if there's a lot of wind. Good, good advice. Um, next up, we have Mount Eddy. Um, and you, you, you know, this description of Mount Eddy, I love because it has a little of everything, meadows, wildflowers, forests, lakes, and then that big, you know, the money view of Mount Shasta when you reach the crest. Absolutely. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is in many ways my favorite hike in the Mount Shasta area because it does have so much. You start out hiking on the Pacific Crest Trail. You go through gorgeous old growth red fir forest. Then you go a mile or more along the side of the mountain where there's all these springs both above and below you, which means that the wildflowers are just stunning in summer. People who are really into botany and wildflowers know that this is just one of the top places on the oh. West Coast to just see a, just profuse wildflowers and then so many different species of wildflowers. So is there a that. particular time, you, know, you say summer, but like, is there, is it July, is it August, or is it kind of like throughout the summer that is a good time to go? Well, throughout the summer, but July would probably really be your sweet spot. Okay. July, most years where you've had a normal snow snowpack and it melted at a normal time, July is just primo. Then you go this, past- This year, who the, knows? <laughs> yeah, this year, who knows, because- we have all this snow now and it's been absolutely great. We put a lot of water in the reservoirs, all those wonderful things. But I remember a few years ago, we had some major storms and big snowpack early in the winter. And then we got next to nothing for the rest of the year. Right. And then we wound up with another situation. Oh, it's early June. And I'm able to go hiking in all these high mountain areas because all the snow has gone. So, yeah, so it goes by, you can see where it goes past uh, the Deadfall Lakes which are stunning, beautiful lakes. This is a metamorphic area. So the rock is reddish. And then you go by Upper Deadfall Lake, which is right below Mount Eddy. It is just a sweet, sweet, gorgeous lake. You can backpack this too. This is a great overnight backpacking trip. You can hike in, camp at Middle Deadfall or even Upper Deadfall and then do your summit climb that day or the next day and then take your pack and head out or stay two nights. Just truly top notch. I also want to say that the website that we're at right here is the website of Bubba Suisse. He is another hiking guidebook author who also lives in the Mount Shasta area. And he has also written a guidebook to the area that's called Hiking California's Mount Shasta Region. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a really good book. It's all color. It goes into a lot of the local hikes in great detail. And so I just wanted to give a shout out to, you know, my fellow guidebook author there who, uh, you know, has written some books and written some great books and also has this fantastic web website, Hike Mount Shasta. He's just I got a that. lot of information. His website is the, the, repository for all the hiking information and hiking in the Mount Shasta area. I love that. I love that you're 
spreading the love around to other it's not it's sort of uh cooperative you know uh guidebook thing i i'm a big fan of guidebooks and maps i think you know like the the internet's awesome you know it's great that we can go to websites like this and and you know have sites like gaia gps and all trails and all of those things are really great i'm you know don't get me wrong but nothing beats a good book or an, and a good map to be able to kind of thumb through and get ideas and and get a little bit on the history and the botany and the, the the wildlife and and all of the other things that you might not pick up on just a you know a, a, a trip report on all trails so <laughs> well i completely support you on that and I would say, yes, have all trails. I have all trails, but also get the guidebooks, use them both. All yeah. trails is for me really shines for giving you up-to-date information, especially for really popular trails. You can look and see, oh, three people posted about what it was like in the last 10 days. So they can let you know, like there was no snow on the trail or wildflowers are peaking right now. That is where all trails really, really shines as far as giving you all the specific details of trail forks and natural history and all that stuff, that is not its strong suit at yeah. all. And that's where guidebooks are really, really important. And, and I'll just add a, a plug. That's also one of the great things about the, the hike logs that I was showing earlier. As we start to get hike logs for Mount Eddy and Castle Dome, et cetera, you'll be able to go to the hike logs on the website or on the app and, and see what other challengers have posted. I think when we were looking at it earlier, there was one posted from today from Wasson Peak in Arizona, and they had some snow in the areas in, in Wasson Peak all the way down near Tucson in the Saguaro National Park. And so that's really pretty neat to be able to see. And you can get that kind of beta um, there as well. So um let's talk about castle dome and castle craig state park now i think it's worth noting as we say here on the overview page that this route is doesn't really take you to this the very top of the dome because that's a highly technical climb and 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 can be deadly right well yes technical i am not a mountain climber so i'm not going to talk so much about the you know how yeah. technical it is there are people that hike up to the base of castle dome and then climb to the top of the dome i once when i was 16 or 17 climbed to the top of the dome and i climbed back down i was also really really scared there are places there one if you don't know the right way to go you can get in huge trouble Right. And even if you do know the right way to go, there are times you are doing things where if you slip, you are going to die. So those are things that I just, I don't do that anymore. So do not try to climb to the top of Castle Dome. However, you will be more than happy just to get to the base of Castle Dome. There are stunning beautiful vistas of Mount Shasta. There's Castle Crags itself, which is all granite, really cool spires and neat things all around there. So you'll be very happy just to have done that. One other nice aspect about Castle Dome is it's a hike that you can do probably nine months or so out of the year, eight or nine months out of the year, because it really tops out at about 4,800 feet or so. That means oftentimes it's below the snow line. It's not right now. There's definitely snow on the trail right now. So don't go right now. Yeah. But it's quite likely that you could do it in, in April, especially if there hasn't been a, a, a storm that's dumped any snow within the last week or 10 days or something like that. So that's, that's the, of all the hikes that are in, this challenge that's the one that is the lowest elevation and that you can you know get off your get off your list earliest and the yeah. and the easiest 
I also want to put a little plug in here for the Mount Shasta Trail Association. We're on their website right now. They are a fantastic organization that's been around for, I don't know, 30 years or more. They built many, many miles of trails in the Mount Shasta area. They maintain lots and lots of trails. And especially over the last decade and a half, they've been really involved with building a network of dozens of miles of mountain biking trails on the lower slopes of Mount Shasta itself, just outside of the town of Mount Shasta. So the town of Mount Shasta and the region is really starting to become a mountain biking Mecca in addition to being a hiking Mecca. And one more plug for the Mount Shasta area in general. I know that many of the people that are doing this challenge aren't from this area and you don't, don't know much about it and you're not very familiar with it, I can just say that there is a lot of beauty here. There's fantastic mountain lakes for swimming. There's hiking trails all over the place that you can use Bubba Suisse's book or my book, Day Hiking, Mount Shasta, Lassen and Trinity Alps regions to explore. There's restaurants, places to stay, campgrounds. You can do dispersed camping all over. Uh, I wrote a book on dispersed camping slash boondocking. I do it all the time in this area. There's just hundreds and hundreds of places to do it all over. So anyway, that's my plug for Mount Shasta. Now I think we're moving on heading south. Yeah, let's look at let's look at Brokoff. So we're down to Lassen Volcanic National Park. Yep. Um, and Brokoff Mount Mountain, 6.9 miles, 2,500 vertical uh, feet. Um, this link takes us to all trails, kind of gives you sort of the, the big overview of this. Um, and you can kind of see the breakdown, you know, where you go, begin the climb, final ascent, and then the summit itself. What do you want to tell us about Brokoff? W what makes this so special? <clears throat> Excuse me. What I appreciate most about Brokoff Mountain is it has, I've got to take a little drink of water. Excuse me. <clears throat> is it has views that rival Lassen Peak, which is just two miles to the north of, north of it and which we'll, we'll be discussing next. However, it is far less crowded than Lassen Peak and it has a lot more variety on the way up to the summit. You go through meadows, you go through forest, whereas Lassen Peak, Stunning, love the hike, but you very quickly are above timberline and then you are just going up an exposed slope the whole way. So Brokoff Mountain is my favorite hike in Lassen Volcanic National Park. And one of my favorites just overall as far as just to climb. It is more difficult. There's more elevation gain compared to doing Lassen Peak. You will see when you look at the social hiker page for this challenge, you'll see where it says John's favorite hikes and then that's hyperlinked. If you click on that and go over to what's on my, my website, you'll see where I compare it to Lassen and say why I like it better than Lassen. So Very keep nice. that in mind. And it's also something that you would access from the southern part of the park. So if you're coming from the Bay Area, you would take Highway 36 from Red Bluff and, and come in that way. All right. And I'm assuming like this right here is, is, is Brokoff Mountain. Or are we on Brokoff Mountain in this picture? That's the shot that I took from the summit of from the summit, okay. From the summit of Brokoff Mountain, and that is looking over to Lassen Peak. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Very cool. All right. Um, well, speaking of Lassen Peak, highest peak in Lassen Volcanic National Park, an active volcano. Do I need to be uh, nervous about that or? <laughs> don't what does that mean <laughs> well what that means is it does have the potential to erupt again but it is the type of volcano that would give signals that it could potentially erupt so that you would be warned they would say hey no don't come into the park or 
they would probably, if they really thought it was imminent, they would say, don't get within 20 miles of this mountain. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, because it could potentially be like a Mount St. Helens type of, a, of eruption. But well, it, it did erupt is a technically over. active too, right? It is, but I think it's less. Less active. Okay. Well, yeah, I would, I would say so. There's, there's more going on with, with Lassen overall, okay. as far as just in the region, there's more volcanic activity type type stuff going on. Uh, I do want to point out if you're climbing Lassen Peak, you are getting up there in elevation, you're going to be at nearly 10,500 feet. Just make sure you're well hydrated, you know, protect yourself from the sun, all this stuff we know when we go hiking and things like that. But this is one where there's a lot of exposure. Same when you climb up to Helen Lake, the very first hike we discussed, there's just, you're just out there in the sun and, uh, and in the elements. It's yeah. also a popular hike. I've never had a problem, you know, parking at the trailhead. There's plenty of parking there. There's a restroom there, all that sort of stuff. And it's not like you're in Yosemite in the Valley floor, Yosemite, you're going up to Nevada and Vernal Falls and it's, literally almost a line of people it's not that at all but you will you'll definitely see some people uh, along the route mm -hmm. whereas i will say when i climbed brokaw mountain a couple of years ago total the whole day going up and back i saw maybe six other people that's nice that is yeah very nice and we had the yeah. summit to ourselves oh that's, that's really special awesome. yeah, yeah. All right, so McGee Peak is a little bit, you know, it's, it's a different area. So um, it, it climbs 3,200 feet. It's, that's like about a thousand feet a mile almost, which I, a, you know, a, I consider that steep. <laughs> that is steep. It, it's, it's a grunt and it's a workout. And this is our, uh, is, would you call this the alternate, Jeff? Or is it is called an alternate, although basically you'll, uh, as a challenger, you can pick which of the which six of the seven peaks so okay. if you want to do sort of the classic six that would be the first six okay um, but you can you can use this you can swap lassen in or you can um uh for any of the other peaks if you so choose so like right. let's say you've already done lassen peak you could do this peak instead okay you know yeah, like in the past like maybe last year you did lassen and you don't want to go back and do a repeat you can you can do something new all right well mcgee peak is one where you might possibly be the only person on the trail and the only person up there so wow. that's something very much in its favor it is another mountain that has fantastic views you'll be able to see last and broke off in mount shasta it is also in thousand lakes wilderness thousand lakes wilderness is to the east of redding and just a bit northwest of lassen peak in lassen volcanic national park and you can backpack there you could backpack up to McGee Peak and then on down into the main part of Thousand Lakes Wilderness where there are lakes and plenty of places to camp. So keep that in mind. There's also alternate routes for getting into Thousand Lakes Wilderness and then climbing up. Can you click on that map and see if we can make that big? There we go, yeah, thank you. You can see if you look right at the top of the screen there, you see McGee Lake. Yeah. Uh, so McGee Lake and the lake just to the northeast of it is- Everett. Yeah, yeah, Everett Lake, Everett and McGee Lake. So you can camp there, you could backpack into there, leave your packs and then climb up to McGee Peak. You would need to come in from one of the alternate trailheads that go into Thousand Lakes Wilderness. The route would be substantially longer for that, but it would also be a fantastic way to get to the summit and then also explore Thousand Lakes Wilderness. I must warn you that once the snow really melts out there and until you start getting the first hard freezes, maybe in late August or early September, Thousand Lakes Wilderness can be a mosquito hell. I mean, just, it can be, be pretty darn bad. So just be aware 
if you're going to hike up through there that you are prepared to deal with that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've had those experiences in on many backpacking trips where you you duck into the tent as soon as you get into camp. You set it up and you duck in and you hide until hopefully when the sun goes down, the mosquitoes go away or you yeah, have you a head net and all of, you know, long yeah, you do all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You have every inch covered and that's okay if it's not hot. Yeah. But if it's, you know, 90 degrees and you're like wearing all this long sleeve stuff and your gloves and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, th these these just sound awesome. Um, you know, some really great peaks, uh, very accessible from a lot of different places. Um, I was I, I had mentioned to you via email, my mom lives in the Bay Area and I, I will oftentimes drive right through this area on my way to visit her. And this would be a great opportunity for me to go and hit some of these peaks. So hopefully we will, we'll, we'll be able to do that sometime this year. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, there were a couple of questions that came in during this thing. Ada was asking about, you know, she asked if, if uh, you could do Black Butte now and says it doesn't seem like it gets very covered in snow. Oh, it, it is totally blanketed with snow right now. I can tell you that from the base to the to the top. So it's it's not doable now, but it could be something that possibly you know, sometimes in May, if we don't get much snow for the next like couple, three months, we go back to drought situation. Right. Then hey, perhaps in May you could uh, you could get up there and just a small little anecdote. People in the area, you don't plant your garden up here until the snow melts off the north side of Black Butte. Once that happens, it's okay to plant your garden. That's ah. what yeah. yeah. Insider knowledge there. Insider knowledge. Um, I, and I'm going to guess that the best way to, to just check on the conditions might be, uh, apart from, you know, looking on the internet, is to check with the ranger station in, in Mount Shasta. Yes, that would be your your best bet because one, they know, and two, they can just literally see it. The, you know, look out the window, go, yep, yeah, there's it's still yeah. covered, completely covered in snow. Right, right, yeah, and that's the same with the route up to Helen Lake. I mean, from town, you can literally just look up and see it. Yeah, uh, John was asking, are there bears on this? The, well, you know, is that a concern? Yeah. Uh, the bears, for the most part around here, they're not like, for the most part, they're not very habituated to people. So most of the bears around here are, oh, I see you, I'm running away type bears. So uh, scaredy bears. Scaredy bears. But let's see, if you are climbing, if you're going up to Helen Lake, not likely there would be bears up there that high in general, even like going up from Bunny Flat. I mean, there, there could be. Um, so I would say you could see bears going to Castle Dome. You could see them going through Deadfall Lakes to Mount Eddy. Um, I think those would be possibilities. I'm gonna look at the list here. McGee Peak, Thousand Lakes Wilderness, there, I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of bears there. I haven't ever seen a bear there, but I, I am sure that they are there in great numbers and they're very happy to be there. <laughs> Lassen um, Peak, no bears, broke off mountain. You, you could see a bear at the very lower elevations there. Question about the bears and backpacking. I know that in, in many places in the Sierra Nevada, for example, um, a bear proof container is required, usually a bear canister in some places. Is that a, a concern if somebody wants to do these as an overnight trip? Do they have to have a bear proof canister or can they counterbalance and hang their food bag? Well, I, I think that you know, hardcore backpackers would say better to have that bear canister and you know, then you're covered. That said, I know that bear canisters are now required if you are backpacking in Lassen Volcanic National Park. Uh -huh. However, the two hikes that we have here are that are in Lassen Volcanic National Park are day hikes, basically. 
So do keep that in mind if you are going to backpack in Lassen Volcanic National Park, you need a bear canister. They are not required if you were to backpack in Thousand Lakes or Deadfall Lakes going up to Mount Eddy, not required. So you could, you know, if you want to hang, you could do that and do that sort of thing. So, okay. And the, the trail running shoes versus boots, I'm, I, I personally, uh, I pretty much always hike in, in trail running shoes. That's me. I have strong ankles and I'm careful where I place them. And I just like super comfortable shoes. I have big old wide feet and it's real hard for me to find anything that fits well. And I have these Lone, Lone Peak Ultras or is it Lone Peak? Is that the company? The Ultra Lone Peak. I wear the same ones actually. Yes. And so like, you know, those are my shoes and that's what I'm wearing. And, you know, but so that's just a, a different, different sort of thing. But if you were to wear boots, I think that when you were climbing up to Helen Lake, that would be where you would most want those boots because there is kind of a rough, roughish trail kind of going up there, but it's real rocky and loose and cindery. So if you're bringing your boots, do it when you go up to, to Helen Lake. All the others, there's, there's an actual trail there. And then I'm really fine with my, you know, my ultras. Yeah, I, I tend to use my trail runners almost exclusively. A couple of exceptions. Um, I did a hike a couple weekends ago that was, I knew was going to be very muddy. And I, and, and there was a chance that it could also have, that we could have some precipitation. And I just thought, you know, I'm going to wear some waterproof boots for this. So I, I did that. But most of the time I'm wearing my ultra long lone peaks. I see Jennifer says, oh yeah, ultra lone peaks, best ever. Um, it is something that's very uh, personal. So really the thing to do, John, is to make sure that you're comfortable hiking and whatever you choose, whether it's trail runners or boots. Um, and, and as John says, he's he would do pretty much all of these within trail runners. One question though I have about that is, uh, what about gators? Uh, do you use like, I know Ultra, the, those Lone Peaks have a little um, gator trap and you know you can do like a little trail running gator. It's not like a full on snow gator or anything like that, but it's just a low lightweight gator to help keep some of the, the pebbles and talus out of your shoe. Do you ever use those? And would you recommend those on any of these? I have not used those, but I think that they could be quite useful, especially going up to Helen Lake. Mm, yeah. And one other thing about Helen Lake is, depending on what time of year, you might have to go through a bit of snow. There might be like, oh, here's a bit of a snow field that we have to cross over before we get to Mortalis on the other side. And then it you know, might be nice to have your boots there for that. Yeah. All right. Um, I don't see any more questions. Jennifer just added the bears are apparently, so they're not like Yellowstone, the bears. And I, I would say, yeah, they're not so um, comfortable with humans. And as John said, they will tend to, if they see you, they're going to tend to try to get away from you, not go towards you. And right. uh, that's a good thing. And that's, and the, and that's a, another good reason for carrying. If you do decide to, um, to do any overnight trips, that's another good reason for doing a bear canister because it does prevent the bears from getting to your food, which once they get to your food, and if you're in a, you know, like a lake or a camp area where a lot of people camp, they're going to start to think, oh, I can come back here and I'm going to do that again. And then that's bad for the bears, bears. and it's bad for the people. Uh, Dalton asked another question. Any need for crampons on any of these? And I'll well, take that. yes, if you would be doing it earlier in the year and there's some snow there. So it could potentially be if you're climbing Lassen Peak that there's some snow higher up, you might think, oh, I want to take some crampons. Uh, so that's something. But then also, again, if you were climbing to Helen Lake, that would be another place if there's snow there. 
that you 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 really might want to have the crampons, especially if there's a lot of snow there, because it does get kind of steep. The 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 route up to the summit, which is 100% not part of this challenge above Helen Lake, there you absolutely have to have crampons and an ice axe and know right. how to use them and all that sort of stuff. Helmet, yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, and I should mention that most people, when they're doing these, the six pack of peaks challenge, most of the people who are, are doing these are waiting until there's no winter, what we would call winter mountaineering required. And anytime you're yeah. using crampons, you know, that's not long, that's no longer a hike. It's, it's something else. It's something called winter mountaineering and there's a, additional risks and knowledge and skills that go along with that. So, um, most people will wait until you know there's there may be a, a short you know traverse of a snow field but it's not um it's not a mountaineering thing at that point and that's exactly what i would recommend um and then we have another question from dalton are any of the, are any of the trails marked clearly enough to do in moderate snow early year stuff like you know i guess maybe blazes on trees or uh, signage or something like that? Basically, no, they aren't. The only one that you could do earlier in the year, as I mentioned before, would be climbing up to the base of Castle Dome. And that's something that if there was a little bit of patchy snow when you got right up near the tippy top of it, you would probably be able to, to make your way through through you know, be able to figure yeah. that out if there wasn't much snow. But for the most part, you, you really do need to wait. Like Castle Dome, you can probably do that in the middle of April. But uh, all the others, there's nothing marked there. And you can't even easily get to the trailhead when there's snow because yeah they, and, they and that's a really that reminds me of a really important point about snow travel is that even if there's not you know if it's fairly gentle slopes because you're traveling over snow you can't necessarily you know you oftentimes can't see any sign of the trail no uh, and oftentimes you might see footprints in the snow and think oh well that must be the trail but it could it could be also just taking you into the middle of nowhere, you know. Like there's no guarantee that the the person who made those footprints knew where they were going, or that they're on the right route, or are they're on the route that you want to go. So navigation becomes of paramount importance when you're on top of snow. So that's a that's another thing to kind of um, be aware of. Uh, and Jennifer says, oh, the challenge ends in October. We can't really start before May at the earliest. So this is really a summer challenge. Pretty much, yeah. I, I mean, we were trying to, what we're, what we're doing is uh, the end of October, uh, beginning of November would be shoulder sea. There's, there, there could be snow, new snowfall at that point on, on some of these peaks. So um, that's, that's our target is to end at the end of October. We may reevaluate that after this year. This is our first year for this challenge, but, um, yeah, so you're really looking at, you know, May, June, July, August, September, and October. You have six months, uh, six solid months to, 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 um, to do six peaks. And I would really focus on that, you know, late June to mid September window, especially July and August as the time to get these. One thing about the Castle Dome hike is that if you can, yeah, try to do that in April or May, but realize in summertime, it can be really hot. Like, oh, it's, you know, it's July 7th. Let's go do Castle Dome. We're going to start at noon it might be 95 degrees up there. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's another thing to be aware of. And that's that's true on a lot of these, especially the trails that are exposed. Um, you know, I know heat, the, the sun exposure makes a huge difference to my energy level and it can slow me down, you know, 
as it, whereas if it's overcast or if it's cooler or if I'm going through a forested section of the trail, a totally different experience. Uh, yeah, that's it's really important. If you can try to get a, a relatively early start to these hikes so that you can get a lot of the elevation gain out of the way. Like, boy, if you can be starting a trail at, at you know, 9 a.m., you're usually in pretty good shape because most of these start at like 6,000, 7,000 feet or higher. So you're in pretty good shape with that. The only exception would be the Castle Dome Trail. Yeah. Uh, Dalton says uh, he had done the Bay Area six pack last year and saw tons of wildlife during his hikes. Um, what, what kind of wildlife or what out wildlife opportunities, you know, might exist on some of these hikes? Well, a lot of the wildlife that you would see in this area would be very similar to what you would see in the Sierra Nevada mountains, just kind of across the board. So if you've gone hiking up in you know, the forest and higher peaks of the Sierra Nevada, you would see a lot of the same species, same same bird species and squirrels and chipmunks and uh, rabbits and, and things of that nature. We, as we discussed before, we have bear, although you're, you might see a bear. We of course have mountain lions, but you count yourself lucky if you ever get to see a mountain lion in your life because they're, I've seen a couple in my life, but they're, they're not easy to see, but uh -huh. you, you'd be able to see. And of course deer, I mean, deer where I live, we I, I see probably 30 or 40 deer a day I don't even think about like oh I'm in the neighborhood in yeah yeah it's just you know your neighborhood deer um so uh yeah you would see plenty of deer that's for sure yeah very cool all right well this has been great uh Philip just says hey great information and thanks um he's You're gonna welcome. put this on his bucket list for if not this year, maybe 2024. So uh, hey. that's awesome. John, I really appreciate your time tonight. I really love the list of peaks that you've helped us to come up with for this. And I think this is gonna be um, a really sweet challenge to do for folks who take it on. And um, I think it's, I think we may see people coming from the Bay Area. We may see people coming from Sacramento. We may see people coming from Oregon, coming south to come do this, and um, uh, I just I, I'm, I'm I can't wait to start seeing the hike logs roll in around May or June and July and this summer in particular. So um, looking forward to that. Yeah, well, I really appreciate you reaching out to me. I've had a great time thinking about what peaks to include and then working with you on that, and I've very much enjoyed this evening. Um, I'm just going to do one quick last thing. Um, let's see. And then we'll wrap it up. Um, oh, swag. I just wanted to mention for people who do register, you can use uh, John's name, J-O-H-N, John, just John. When you check out, put that in the coupon code and save 20% off your registration for the NorCal challenge. Um, you'll get a hiker tag in your welcome pack with some stickers. And then the finishers, we're doing these enamel pins. Um, they're really nice. It's a, a, br a brushed or a polished steel pin with a cloisonne finish, you know, enamel finish embedded in that. And uh, those are for all of the finishers along with a certificate of achievement. And we have monthly gear giveaways. We have monthly um, Zoom happy hours where you get a chance to come on the screen and we can talk and share what, you know, whatever the topic is. The topic for next, our next one in March is going to be about finding people to hike with, you know, creating your own group or joining another hiking group or club uh, and some opportunities for hooking up with people to um, tackle some of these peaks together because I think that's, that can be a lot of fun. And, and I just wanted to finish, close out by saying thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Um, I've loved hearing more about some of these peaks and the ins and outs, and I'm really kind of like got the gears turning for some trips 
down your way, John. Can't wait to uh, check check it out. Fantastic.